And um, so I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Gerald Rubin, who is the Vice President of Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the Executive Director of the Jamelia Farm Research Campus. And so, as you can see, we've, had, we've talked about a center that's based in a uh, based in the university, talked about centers that are affiliated or part of 501c3, uh, affiliated with a university, and now um, outside the university environment. So I'm not going to use slides so that I can be nimble and really focus my talk on things that might contrast from what you heard today or compare our situation. So what you've heard so far today is from probably the most successful examples of people in existing institutions trying to shift those institutions, build something within the confines of those institutions to address the problem of convergent research. I'm going to tell you about something a little bit different. So suppose, which was the case in our case, that you had no facts on the ground, no existing culture, no institution, no faculty, uh, and someone said, create from scratch an institution to, as was our case, to tackle some of these problems of what at that point was called interdisciplinary uh, research, and we're going to give you ample funding so that you can build a building you can um, fund the people researching there. And so no one in our institution takes money from anyone. No one can take money. No one can write a grant. So we're totally internally uh, funded. So there's no entrepreneurial fundraising. The entrepreneurial has to be in the, uh, in the research. We're uh, asking people to jump in with both feet so they don't have a department of affiliation. In fact, they have no tenure. We have people who have given up tenure at Stanford, at Princeton, at the University of Washington, at Brandeis to come there. Our deal with them is, quite bluntly, I say, you have a contract for five or six years. I'm investing, Howard Hughes Medical Institute is investing $10 million. You are betting your career. If that is too risk, if you're too risk adverse for that, then you're not the person I want to have in my institute. You're better off in the university. So we're trying to be at the fringes. Everything we do, we like to think is really great for that 10% of people who are at the fringe. Indeed, we have many people who work at Genelia, three former members of the technical staff of Bell Labs, who left Bell Labs and went in the industry because we never wanted anything to do with, with being in academics. And we have other people who don't like the academic world. So we're, by doing this, we don't have to change the culture. What we did is try to create a culture that said we want to do, I think now we qualify as convergent research, and we want people who want to come here, and because they want to do that, because they prefer to do that, because they're frustrated by their present situation or see this as being more attractive. So what is the research we're doing? So in 2002 is when the Howard Hughes trustees made the decision to do this. We've been open 2006, so we've been open for seven years. So in, in between that decision and opening, besides designing and building a building, we had planning exercises to say, what are the problems we should try to do? And our goal was to pick problems that couldn't easily be done in the university because they required this convergent research, which was maybe getting better, but slowly, but was not easy, certainly, uh, then, and it would require a long-range commitment of funding. So we picked two areas after having these planning workshops. One was understanding the basic principles by which nervous systems store and process information. I would say that was a precursor to what's now called the Brain Initiative. And then imaging technology, developing new optical imaging technology, mainly optical because it has the spatial resolution and time resolution you need for biology and machine vision and other computational methods for analyzing that data. Because we concluded, based on these planning workshops, that just the way DNA sequencing and cloning had been the fundamental enabling technology for biology over the last 30 years, we felt imaging live systems at high resolution, high speed, was going to be the enabling technology for the next 30 years. So we settled with those two goals. We went to get people who said, I really want to work on those problems. I'm willing to work on them the way people join startup biotech companies because I want to be the best other people that I need to partner with, to work with, to do that. So compared to any university department, we are very narrow as far as our intellectual goals, but very broad as far as the disciplines 
we hired. Only probably slightly over half of our people have training in bi initial training in biology. We have physicists, computer scientists, engineers who have come together because to, they want to try to solve these problems. So they've taken the fact that they're going to have a small laboratory. They're not going to have big groups. They're going to have to leave their ego somewhere at the door or get the ego from solving a big problem together. So it appeals to a different kind of person that would want to be a tenured professor at Harvard. Uh, I haven't been at Harvard, so I can remember at one point in my past, I know what that means. I do. They're wonderful, and Howard Hughes Medical Institute supports a large number of them, so I'm not dissing them, but a lot of people don't want to do this. We're not trying to appeal to everyone. We're trying to get those people who are misfits in the current thing, who would prefer to work in this kind of environment, and there are a number of them. And, uh, and we encourage collaboration because no one lab gets the resources that we need to do the whole thing. They can't build an empire. They have to build the empire by teaming up with their people. They're all common because they're interested in the common problems. This has uh, worked well. I think we have excellent core facilities. I'd like to see that from the Deep Institute. And another thing, I, uh, you didn't really talk about salaries and supporting these people, but another thing I, I would really resonated with is the problem that I've seen from being in places like Berkeley, where I'm a emeritus faculty member, is in universities, most universities, they think that the faculty is up here, and then there are a bunch of transient, poorly paid individuals who may be very creative, and they turn over. So I just did a comparison. It's generally, we have 45 faculty members, and we have 45 people, I would say, are senior support people. They're either in labs or in our shared core facilities. And if I take those 90 people, and I took the top 45 salaries, they're half support people and half faculty. So we have no problem having a faculty member having an employee that reports to them who's paid more than they are. And there's just no way if you're going to do this, you cannot do that. You cannot get a first-rate software engineer and not pay them more than an assistant professor. If you're committed, your institution commits you to do that, you have a real problem, I think, in doing this. I think you've overcome that. And I think that's an important thing I want to emphasize. So it's not just faculty issues, it's staff research staff issues. This also addresses the problem, I think, of what all the people we train do who can't become assistant professors. We can create positions for them. It's exactly what you want because those people, if they're committed to this, don't have to worry about getting a paper out next year, getting a grant. They're willing to work on a project that may take five years. It's not career suicide for them to do that, whereas for many, a postdoc it might be. So I think they're a core part of the equation for really achieving um, uh, this kind of research. and. As I already mentioned, we have a career path for people from industry who want to do basic research but don't want to become a faculty member. Our, uh, it was mentioned earlier, I think, by Phil, that faculty are busy and don't have time to talk, so we make it so our faculty aren't busy because they don't have to write grants. They can only have small lab groups. We require them to be on campus 75% of the time. I tell my faculty, be in an study section, consult for a company, sit on the beach in Tahiti. They're all equivalent activities to me. But 75% of the working days, you better be in the building because it's part of your job. When a colleague wanders down the hall and says, I have a problem you can help me with, you've got to be there and you have to have time for this. So that's our community service. So we set up this model. Sort of everything in our model, I could say, is stolen from somewhere else, mostly from Bell Labs, MRC Labs here in electrical biology. There's nothing we're doing that I can't tell you where we stole the ID. Uh, dear from, but we've combined them in a different way, and we've been very fortunate, as I already mentioned, to have this enabling thing of a very uh, wealthy donor. In this case, it's, it's Howard Hughes and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So they're footing the bill uh, for all of it. So I think I'll stop there.